Welcome to your Artsy Girl podcast. I am your host, Christina Carrere. This is a podcast about art, poetry, and anything about creativity. Sit back, relax, and get your dose of brain food to get your creative juices flowing. Welcome to episode 22. Rebecca Mabangla Mayor's nonfiction, poetry, and short fiction have appeared in print and online in several journals and anthologies, including Katipunan Literary Magazine, Growing Up Filipino 2, More Stories for Young Adults, Cuento, Small Things, and Beyond Lumpia, Pansit, and Seven Manang's Wild, an anthology. Her poetry chapbook, Pause Mid-Flight, was released in 2010. She is also the co-editor of True Stories, The Narrative Project, Volume 1, and her poetry and essays have been collected in Dancing Between Bamboo Poles. She has been performing as a storyteller since 2006 and specializes in stories based on Filipino folktales and Filipino-American history. Rebecca, as Rebecca A. Saxton, received her MFA in creative writing from Pacific Lutheran University in 2012, her BA in Humanities from Washington State University in 1998, and her MA degree in English with honors from Western Washington University in 2003. Everyone, please welcome my next featured guest. Hi, Rebecca. Rebecca Welcome to the show. Hi, Christine. It's good to be here. Thank you. I'm so honored you wanted to be on your Artsy Girl podcast and for being my featured Artsy Fartsy guest today. (laughs) So before we talk about your newly released book, I would like to get to know you a little more. In fact, the audience would like to get to know you a little more. Um, Can you tell us where you were born and where you grew up? Sure thing. So I was born in Seattle, Washington, and I grew up in the bustling suburb of uh, Seattle called Federal Way, which uh, has the reputation, notoriety of being named after a road, the Federal Way. A small suburban town uh, just north of Tacoma and basically grew up in all white neighborhoods, mostly white schools, Um, went to a Catholic elementary school, Catholic high school, then went off to WSU um, for college. And so, um, yeah, it was a very non-Filipino way to grow up. So my dad is Tagalog. And my mother is Pankasinan Ilocano. They both came over in 1955, but they didn't meet until they came stateside. Um, Dad was uh, just joined the U.S. Navy. And my mom uh, was an army brat. Uh, My grandfather was a Philippine scout (gasps) and fought during the early days of um, World War II. Right. Um, Escaped the Bataan Death March. Um, and then went on to uh, join the regular U.S. Army and served in during the Korean War. And it was after the Korean War they decided to uh, move to the United States um, and settle in Seattle. So uh, the story goes that um, my dad arrived in November on the USS Barrett and my mother arrived in December on the USS Barrett. Uh, and uh, she did not like the cold weather. Um, she was pretty sure she made a terrible mistake coming to so, the United States. When you mean U- USS Spirit, that is the ship? That That's the USS Spirit is the name of their ship. Mm-hmm. That they arrived in the States? Yep. In, they in they the arrived in the ship? Sp- That's right. But two different wow. sailings. Two different sailings. Oh, wow, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's a pretty cool story. Um <laughs> So she was pretty homesick and word got out through the Philippine community of uh, Seattle that there was this lonely Filipina and, and my dad and three of his buddies went over to try to make her feel welcome. And he happened to be holding the flowers they had all bought for her and she just took to him. Um, and so they... Uh, wait, wait, wait. So they, y- your father and his buddies heard yeah. about this lonely Filipina. Okay. So yeah. how did that happen? How did that... Uh, it, how, how many Filipinos were there in Seattle? Oh, so there's the Filipinos, uh, Filipino community started 
um, just after uh, the Philippine American War, when the Philippines became a protectorate of the United States, part of the and I put it in air quotes, agreement, was that the United States would prepare the Philippines to be its own self-governing body after, you know, 300 plus years of colonization uh, by Spain. So there would be these waves of young men who would come over uh, as students and go to school. And and some of them would be successful. uh, And then some of them would just kind of get stuck in the U.S. Uh, They would uh, end up as houseboys. They would end up in agriculture. And so we have these waves of immigration of of Filipinos to the U.S. So um, when my father arrived, um, the Filipinos, the old Manongs, uh, had created this community in Seattle uh, and they just they just knew each other. Some worked down in Bremerton, where where the the Navy um, shipyard was, where my dad was. Some were in Seattle, and and it's just you know they took in the young men and and uh, made them feel at home. And uh, and so by the time they arrived, there was a, a fair fairly large Filipino community in the Seattle area. And so, yes, that's, that's exactly what happened is that word got out. Uh, you know, my, my mom was staying with a family friend um, in, uh, in a part of Seattle that is escaping me. I think it, it was Beacon Hill, not really quite sure. Um, and so she was basically staying with an aunt and uncle who were family friends of my grandfather's. And uh, she had come up. Uh, so the bear, USS Barrett doesn't come into Seattle, it went into San Francisco. So she took the train from San Francisco up to Seattle. And, uh, you know, she tried to settle in. Um, but in the Philippines, she actually had a, a fairly good life there as the eldest daughter of a sergeant of the U.S. Army. And so when she arrived, she expected um, people to help her with her washing people to help her with anything she needed around the house. And so to go from that to being told, well, if you want your clothes washed, you know, there's the washer, ringer washer. Um, (laughs) You're going to have to learn how to iron your own clothes. She just, she just thought, you know, the United States wasn't uh, all that was advertised. Uh, Plus, you know, Seattle in, in the winter is miserable. Uh, She never knew she could be so cold and she came for the apples. She loved apple pie and she came for the apples. So there was like, there was nothing until those four men arrived at the door. There was nothing for her. (laughs) So they were all vying for her attention. Well, yeah, the Monongs had selected one of them to, to be uh, the guy who was going to get the girl. Um, And, uh, he he was the spokesperson. He was a, of the four of them. He was the one who was the most confident in his, in his English. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, or actually, now that I think about it, probably just confident as a speaker because she spoke Tagalog. Um, and the Monongs all thought, well, okay, he's he was willing to like change the diapers of of the family. I, I, he was staying with a cousin or something like that, and she had young children and he was willing to change diapers. So he was obviously father material. Um, (laughs) The only other thing anyone knew about the rest of them is that they all played poker together. So, you know, so they were betting on this one guy, but, um, and he was a spokesperson and she had only eyes from my dad, even though he said nothing because he held these flowers and um, she was polite and all of that sort of stuff. And they corresponded because he would be out on the ship and yada, yada, yada. And, and yeah, eventually all of those stories will get into a book. <laughs> Cause I, was really gonna, do I, remarkable. I was wondering about that because yeah. my stuff gets into the book. I mean, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, so they were married for 55 years. They had a very long, <laughs> wonderful marriage with two children and, and, uh, you know, as far as like American Dream is concerned, they made it. They, mm. they, they made it in the U.S. And my dad was number six of eight. And then mom was number one of six. Uh, and um, so very large, very Catholic families. Um, 
And then I think I, I would say that they did very well for, for themselves. Mom passed on in uh, 2017, and, uh, but my dad is still in federal way, um, still involved in his church, uh, doesn't play as much poker as I think he used to. But, um, but other than that, yeah, he's, he's, pretty, he's doing pretty well. Okay, so who were your earlier influences? Now that I understand, you know, your background and your mm-hmm. rich uh, history, mm-hmm. um, who were your earlier influences such as for writing and poetry? Sure, sure. So it's a great question. Um, what I like to say is that what got me into the game was uh, fantasy stories. So the first book I ever bought with my own money um, at, uh, what was the name of the bookstore? I think it was Walden Books in the Old South Center Mall, um, was The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And so uh, my second grade teacher read it to us during the winter, so chapter by chapter. And I just had to have this book. So C.S. Lewis was the earliest influence, I would say. Although my mother read to me as a child, it's, it's the reason why I'm such a, a, a heavy reader and was a heavy reader. The story was that if you ever wanted me to be quiet, you just gave me a book and stuck me in a corner. Um, you know, being sent to my room to read was not a punishment. Uh, so there was that. And then later I progressed. Of course, I had to get the entire series of Chronicles of Narnia. Mm-hmm. I couldn't just read the first one. Uh, read all of those and then progressed to um, uh, Tolkien, and later Richard Bach, Neil uh, Gaiman, Nick Bantock. Um, but my heaviest influence now is an author by the name of uh, Charles DeLint. He's a Canadian author. And he pays attention to First Nations stories and has kind of the same question that I have for fantasy, which is what happens when the old gods and the new gods meet each other. So the gods, the spirituality that comes over from the homeland and it hits the North America and there's already gods there. Did it work out? Was there conflict? You know, all of those things. Um, Neil Gaiman's American Gods talks a lot about that uh, too. And of course, you know, there's not a, a whole lot in the mainstream about Filipinos in general history or anything, right. but Filipino, um, cosmology and perspective and spirituality. Um, And then of course we have to break it down by, you know, grouping. Um, It's just not, not in there. And so a lot of what influenced me too was what I call the Uhura effect, which is that um, Oprah Winfrey uh, was very struck by the fact that she saw Uhura on Star Trek. And that's what got her inspired that black women could be more than maids. Right. And so I try to do basically the same thing. I try to tell myself the stories that I wish I could have read back in the day. Um, what went well? I, I just kind of see this. Sometimes it was like war and, oh my gosh, it's conflict. And then other times it was a bunch of spirits sitting out going, okay, so you got a recipe for this? You know, we got this, some salmon here and like, oh yeah, we got this thing called uh, Sinigang. We should try this. And, and they just get together and they, they exchange um, recipes and they try to survive the things that are, they're going through. And so um, those human relationships that are reflected in spirituality, those spiritual relationships that are reflected in humanity, you know, these are all things that I'm really interested in. Now, poetry, I will tell you, I stumbled on by accident. Um, Sometimes it was a writing exercise. Um, Other times it was a response to um, what was going around um, at the time. Um, And, you know, what's great about poetry is for me, and I do not mean any disrespect to any poet out there, is that I can dash out a few lines and look at it and go, okay, I think it says what I wanted to say, or hmm, no, I think I need to go back and I need to work on it. Uh-huh. And I don't have to track as many what's going on with this arc things that I need to do with um, even uh, uh, an essay or a short story. Um, 
And I know there's some beautiful, long epic poems. I mean, we have a history of epic poems in the Philippines Mm -hmm. um, that go on for days and days and days. Uh, That's not the kind of poetry that I'm doing. Uh, For me, it's just basically bouncing off some sort of central question, central image, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then finding out that people um, respond to it. So that's, uh, that's where I come from. Oh, um, you say you're a storyteller. Mm -hmm. What does that mean in this day and age? (laughs) That's a really great question. So when I say that I'm a storyteller, um, I am talking about being a performance storyteller. Um, I believe everyone is a storyteller. We are telling um, the story of our lives to ourselves and to each other every moment of the day, whether or not we're paying attention to it. And then there are the times where you just know there's that one person in your family that just has everybody captivated. They can tell stories from the past. They can tell jokes, whatever. There's that kind of storyteller. And then there's um, what I call professional liars who, um, who write down their stories um, whether or not that's for a play, a TV show, a movie, a novel, a short story, all of those are kinds of, of storytelling. But when I talk about myself as a storyteller, I'm talking about my, my performance storyteller. So the story goes that in the year 2000, I realized I was not a white man, despite all of my years of training. Um, Basically, it was about succeeding. It was about the way you achieve the American dream was to be a white man, as close to being a white man as you could, right? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I went to a Women of Conference, a Women of Color Conference in Vancouver, BC, um, that I went, oh, wait, I am not identifying as a woman of color. That's how deeply the oppression has gone, that I have totally trained myself not to see myself as a woman of color. you did say in the opening that, you know, you you grew up in Seattle and it was mostly Mm -hmm. white neighborhood. And so that kind of, you know, I'm sure it affected you and the way you saw yourself in the whole scheme of things. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so from there, it was like, okay, so how do you get that back? You know, Uh, I unfortunately suffered a fair amount of lateral oppression when it came to the Filipino community. Uh, Growing up, I got the classic, oh, you're U.S. born. Oh, (laughs) you know, you don't speak the language. And those pitying looks after a while just, you know, from well-meaning people um, uh, just wore at me. It's like, no, I don't want to even be involved in that. And so it took me a long time to get back to the Filipino community uh, and and to talk to them, let alone perform for them. Uh, That's another story. But in trying to figure out what, uh, how I could relate to my heritage in a way that was mine, um, I came across performance storytelling. And that means people standing on stage, they know a story from, or they've learned a story, a traditional story from some heritage, and they tell that story in the same style as was likely told, the, the story was originally told. Now, sometimes their, their interpretations um, of those stories, um, their, you know, received interpretations, uh, anyone who's done research that's based in like the Grimm stories, uh, the Brothers Grimm, or any sort of um, kind of folklore compilation of, of say, the early um, 19th century, 20th century kind of stuff. Those are all kind of received and interpreted by one single source and then sent back out. And so we play with that a little bit more. And I've been in ensembles, um, storytelling ensembles, uh, a good 15 years now, uh, primarily the Bellingham Storytellers Guild, although I'm not with them right now. Um, And, but I've performed with like Ethnotech, uh, which is a, a uh, storytelling couple out of San Francisco. I was um, in the Asian American Storytelling Festival um, at the National Storytelling Network Convention uh, in 2017. And there, what I believe is that stories hold two very vital pieces of information, a culture's worldview and their values. And so if you, uh, actually, I'm sorry, three things also traditional knowledge. So if you look at stories, 
in that way, traditional stories in that way, they start unpacking, you can start unpacking all sorts of really cool information that you can bring forward, help others understand, um, help yourself understand. Uh, and when I was thinking about traditional knowledge, Lynn Wilkin did a lot of really great research on Maui stories. Mm-hmm. It makes a pretty good argument that the Maui stories were stories of navigation, that Maui was not a single person necessarily, but was a group or a, a, a designation among the sailors. If you were a Maui, you knew how to get around. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then narrative, our brains are built on narrative. Uh, so the, those navigational ways were put into stories because they were the easiest package for our brains. And they persisted for years. And, and I haven't done a lot of research with, a, with other um, narrative uh, navigational stories, but it makes sense. There'll be, you'll come across a story and there'll be this weird throwaway line and no one will understand why, why do we need to know about this particular plant um, or this particular animal during this time of year. And then you'll talk to an, an elder and they'll be like, well, that's because un- unless you have those three conditions, that particular salmon is not running on the river. So you need to look for that bird, that, that plant and the flowering of that particular tree. And that's the reason why that character could find and talk to the salmon. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, and so uh, there's a rich richness in that. And then storytelling for me, it's a community event. When you're a writer, you know, you're in front of your computer, you're in front of your notebook, and you're writing your impression of a thing. Um, and you, it's an audience of one. You're both the performer as well as the audience. And that works really well for a lot of, of writers. Um, but for me, what I found is that I really love the interaction between myself and an audience because the story is in between us. It exists between us and magic can happen. I learn more from a story after performing it or while I'm performing it um, than if I just read a single account. Because I'm watching the audience and how are they reacting and, wow. you know, oh, when are they holding their breath and when are they leaning in? Right. This all gives me information about what the power of that story is all about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's storytelling. So uh, can you tell us a little more about your new collection of poetry and essays entitled Dancing Between Bamboo Poles? Mm-hmm. Where did you get the idea of this collection? Well, it... <laughs> So the poems themselves were um, written, I'm just looking in the book right now because I can't quite remember. They were written in Poetry Month 2015. And if it's all right, I'd like to read the essay that Absolutely. starts the poetry section. Okay. It's called, it's called The Art of Silencing. I would have written a shorter letter, but I did not have the time. Blaise Pascal, 1656. For Poetry Month in 2015, I decided to do a series of redaction poems. My writing practice felt dry and uninspired, and my time was limited by a full-time college teaching position, academic leadership responsibilities, and the usual tasks of a wife and mom of two teens. I lacked the discipline I thought would be required to find and craft words into readable poems on a daily basis. As a teacher of composition, however, I already had my editor's skills in the forefront. It seemed natural to take existing prose pieces and redact words to create poems. The plan was simple. Find a random page from a book and pluck from, plucked from a shelf wherever I found myself. At home, cookbooks and gardening manuals were likely targets. At my college office, style manuals and c- books on culture were the norm. At the tutoring center, books on science and math dominated the shelves. Every book was fair game, and the only criterion for choosing a passage was whether a word on the page caught my attention. Passages had to be at least five lines long and readable. Once I found a passage, I copied the page, enlarging the text for readability. Then I took up my favorite Sharpie pen and went to work. I allowed myself to redact as many words as I wanted, but required myself to leave at least one word per line. As the month went on, I found myself particularly attracted to active verbs and vibrant nouns. The practice became a game for me to find and keep the best, most interesting words. In the end, I would review the poems by reading it out loud and redact those few remaining words I thought unnecessary. More than once, I regretted the haste of my Sharpie that obliterated a word I would have rather kept. I resisted the urge to start over. 
The poems were truly exercises of creativity, experimentation, and surrender. I posted the pictures of my poems to my Facebook page and didn't think I would do much with them after the end of Poetry Month. In the early summer, though, a call for poetry submissions crossed my email and I wanted to participate. The familiar dread of not having the time or creativity to write new work came over me. Then I remembered my redaction poems. I reviewed several, chose a few, combined a couple, and edited them further. To my delight, one poem titled Muskeg, a combination of two redactions, was accepted by the anthology Noisy Water Poetry for, from Whatcom County, Washington. Redaction poems are similar to found poems in that they reflect the idea that art can be found in the most mundane, unexpected places. Redactions, however, seek to show that a silencing has occurred. If you look closely enough, the missing can be found again. Although my poems began as reductions, they became found poems in the final edits because the redactions are not visible. Occasionally, I've added words in parentheses to show they didn't exist in the original texts. Ultimately, the poems I wrote in 2015 reflect my own continuing conversation about silences, something of deep concern in this post-2016 election time. People like me are in fear of being silenced in subtle and violent ways. We fear our histories will be blotted out with black marks of denial and revision. This is one way to look at the future. The possibility redactions represent culturally, though, is a sense of what was hidden has been revealed. Things overlooked and unseen are voiced because the, the noise of the expected is silenced. Ideas can find new connections, much like we allies and advocates can find each other to work for a better world despite the shadow that rises before us. And interestingly enough, this was all before the Mueller report. So, uh, <laughs> you know, all of a sudden it became incredibly relevant <laughs> in an <laughs> odd way. So that's... Wow. that. So, so this was created, um, like, before the election? Right. Yeah. Right. It was just... So 2015... Uh, so about the same time of year that we are in now before the 2020 election. Um, you know, but back then, of course, we had just kind of high hopes. Um, we, we still had the optimism of the Obama era. Right. And uh, at the same time, we had this kind of horror of what could possibly be with Trump being on the, yes, within remember. striking distance, right? I remember. And then sort of like laughable all at the same time. It's like, how could this be? And then, and then it played out, right? right. And so... Um, when I put together the collection, or actually that, that particular essay about the poems, um, it was that horrible feeling of, no, that did not go the way we planned. Um, and now what do we do? Right. And, and I like the, the, the way you played this, about the silencing, the redacting, and, mm -hmm. and then how you ended it with that notion of being, you know, the, the fear of being silenced, you know, right. in the political realm. Yeah. And I, th I think we, we have been, and, and we may have made progress. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, how long did it take for equal marriage to happen? How long did it take before the anti Michigan nation laws were taken off the books? You know, just, so it's not like all of a sudden we've been silenced. There's been a, a, a history right. of it. Right. And so it's like, well, yes, so what, we don't want what, that ha happen again, but can, what can we do? What, what did the silencing do for us, not against us, but do for us. And how can we build on that? You know, that that's a, an interesting question to me. Yeah. Although that silencing has been happening for mm -hmm. ever. Sure. Absolutely. But because of the, you know, the uh, Trump and, and all that, that mm -hmm. what was it that made it so profound, this whole notion of being silenced again? I think it was, for me, it was an awareness of what um, what voice I had achieved. So like, you know, mm. between 2000 and 2015, right. you know, it was very much a process of getting my voice out uh -huh. and it no longer being a voice that's been put through this set of filters so that it could be Yes. Um, more palatable. Okay. So seeing all of that, that which was gained, and then the potential of having that be taken away again, right. um, you know, it, it collapsed a lot of people. Yes. Um, 
and it collapsed a lot of people for very good reason because, you know, I, I do enjoy a certain amount of social privilege. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's all of those questions of, okay, so what, how am I going to make sure that what I gained is not lost and how can I make sure that this does not happen for other people and, and in specific my students uh, who um, were attending a tribal college uh, at the time and they were just trying to find their voices. And so there is something about saying, okay, look, I've come through this. Um, you are going through your own things. You, you know, we're told you were a dummy lummy um, all of your life and now you're in college. Mm -hmm. How are you going to build on that? Because your voice is important without your voice. The, the Salish Sea is not going to survive. You know, we are going to have problems with the coal train and um, ports, uh, you know, in which pollution can happen, uh, devastating to, to the Salish Sea, you know, all of those sorts of things. So, again, it's not one person saying, okay, my voice is not going to be silenced. It's me saying, you no, know, all of us yeah. need to be heard. Because the other thing that happened with the with the election of, of 45 is that um, we have finally heard from people who have felt and were silenced for a great many years mm -hmm. um, per force of themselves because suddenly the world wasn't uh, the way they thought it was or um, for whatever reason just just did not feel like they could be be heard and the fear and scarcity that came up as a result and they were going to do something about that. And they had found a, a, a representative of that. Mm -hmm. um, the wounds aren't healed. Uh, that's the thing. Um, the wounds of this nation have not been healed. They, you know, they were pol politely set aside. Right. Um, and then they came back. So we have to pay attention to the things that have been silenced. Mm -hmm. um, because it, they definitely came roaring back in 2016. Um, so yes, that. yes, absolutely. Um, so do you have a couple of poems? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I mentioned in the essay, um, Muskeg. I'll read that one first. Okay. Muskeg. Exposed and scrubby, proceed north along the wide coastal landscape covered with peat lands. Travel to Prince Rupert, thread your way, stunted and gnarled to large pools of yellow pond wheat snaking between thick forest of bog laurel and common juniper in the humid, subdued slopes of considerable steepness. Seek Muskeg to the west like the Queen or Hecata or Alexander. Find the continuous, tangle, diverse and mixing with Indian, hellebore and partridge foot. Misapprehension of place, sense of proportion, lost, a way of seeing predicated on balance. Move from sight to insight. Create a vision and understanding of place. Creation began a story older than this place. These steps, that bramble tangle water churn. Interpretation alone is fitting. Looking away from the light, that is God. Composed of redactions taken from text found in Plants of the Pacific Northwest Coast by Jim wow. Pohar, Andy McKimmon, and Reasoning Together, edited by Janice Akus. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Wow. Very descriptive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And why did you uh, entitle your collection um, Dancing Between Bamboo Poles? It's very, very <laughs> intriguing. <laughs> Well, uh, so there is this, this larger thematic of um, existing, my, my experience existing between two cultures, you know, mm -hmm. growing up in the United States, but having a heavy, heavy influence uh, from the Philippines, um, from both sides of my family, um, between one family that is was very privileged um, due to uh, my grandfather's military involvement. And then my father coming out of um, not as privileged socially in the Philippines, but then working his way up through the Navy and then 
getting his college degree and all of this sort of stuff. Um, so what does it mean to have social privilege, not have social privilege, because that's only really relative to the Filipino community and within the larger Asian American community, larger American community. What does all this all mean? There's that sort of in between. There's also the between of um, my parents who are firmly in their uh, Filipino heritage and then my children who are firmly in their American heritage and I'm somewhere in between. But then, of course, it's evocative of tinickling, um, and in some ways, sinkill. I try to um, bring in the flavors of both that uh, tinickling being the the traditional uh, kind of peasant dance of the done between two bamboo poles clicking together, and the dancers trying not to get their ankles trapped, like uh, the the. I think it's the tinickling bird, if I remember correctly, right. getting caught in the in the trap, and then then of course Sinkil uh, of the um, the southern provinces, uh, the story of the princess um, escaping through the forest, and she's trying to avoid the falling bamboo as she's as she's escaping. Um, that's a much stronger, much uh, it it has a, a maybe a darker deeper sort of feel that the story does versus the, you know, just dancing, you know, during fiesta time kind of thing. Right. And so I wanted to give both of those impressions. Also this idea of, okay, so what does expression mean between poetry and prose? Uh, what are the things that poetry gives that prose doesn't give? What are the things that prose gives that poetry doesn't give? So there's all, all of these idea of betweenness, yes. but grace and art coming out of those tensions um, is all evoked within that title, Dancing Between Bamboo Poles. I almost didn't go with it, quite honestly, because I thought, oh, this is so, everybody knows Filipinos and their tinickling dances, you know, and I didn't want to, do, the last thing I want to be is stereotypical. But there was so much about that image. <laughs> I just couldn't escape it. <laughs> you know what, though? It, you, tinickling <laughs> didn't come to my mind when I saw that, okay know, then. The title. It didn't. <laughs> I was like, okay, dancing between bamboo poles. You know, I mean, I was intrigued. I was like, what is it about? You know, <laughs> but no, for real, it didn't. It didn't come. I don't know why. But that's okay. <laughs> now, now it makes sense to me. Sure. I was like, okay, you know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I do. Dance. I do mention that in the back cover. I don't mention Sinkil in the back cover, but I do. Uh-huh mentioned uh-huh. tinickling. Uh, so you have so. another one to share with us? Sure. Okay. So Muskeg opens the collection uh, and then in vastness um, completes the collection. In vastness, practitioners of water, the sum of all flow, glinting dew, shimmering sea foam, frozen ice sheets, need the open spaces of deep valleys, Trenches between open mountains, swales or sloughs, cricks and creeks, even thumbprints to bear witness to the shifting rhythms of creation, the dissolution of canyons, the flooding fields, the tender berry shoots, the calving whales. Appeal to the emotions, the waters that move reason to foolishness and drift drab, humorless subjects into wonder, a cat's eye green, a spider web strung between silver bumpers, orange, yellow, lava cascading from mountain birth to sea death. Thousands of markers beyond the beaver in the marsh, beneath a clasp of stars into desired depths where compulsion overrides the sensibility of a life lived safely. Once a young man in a small town barbershop left a message, my pledge, work, save, sacrifice, endure. The whole struggle the kind of renunciation we are all called upon to make. Our best effort, our single-mindedness separate us from the problems we confront. And yet, the diversity born of water compels us beyond boundaries of lives within steel and concrete, asphalt and fossil fuels, to seek those who still remember water. Composed of redactions found from the text, A Sequence of Academic Writing by Lawrence Behrens and Leonard J. Rison. Mm. And I think that was the other thing that was really intriguing, was to try 
and create a poem where you, you would have difficulty figuring out where it came from, mm-hmm. you know, um, like I said, there oh, yeah, were the, math the, yeah. texts in here. Um, it's like, I don't want it to sound like a math text, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. It's really cool. Those really are cool. poems. Those are the poems. Do you have a poem to share that kind of reflects the other side? Well, you know, I, I thought maybe that you would have some that touched base on, on some of the Filipino themes or Filipino. Mm. Oh, okay. This one. Mm-hmm. Cultural survival. Preserving our identities is an easy answer to defend purity against mongrelization. Most people are not racists. The answer is not white, nor capitalist either, nor produced by people whose impeccable cultural identity is the problem. The people most opposed to identity aren't much interested in the real-life versions of the fictional ones, which are, at best, Intemperate remarks by chickens who cling to the concept that has ever widening widening circulation. The answer to who are we is increasingly the assertion of cultural identity and indigenism and our interconnectedness predating common time and reaching toward an undetermined future. Composed of redactions taken from text found in The Trouble with Diversity by Walter Bean Ben Michaels. Wow. So there's that, you know, the, there's a phrase that Filipinos are the jokers of culture. And I don't know if you grew up with that idea. Um, And it could have been just because my father was, like I said, he was an inveterate um, poker player. But the reason why, and I remember my grandfather talking about this too, the reason why um, Americans liked Filipinos is because they were so agreeable Mm -hmm. and would get along just fine with pretty much anyone. Um, And so a joker can be used in any hand. So there's a certain versatility in that. But then here's the question of, okay, well then, then what is your identity within this vast possibility, you know, I think I struggled and I still struggle with that. What does it mean to be Filipino Mm -hmm. um, living where I live uh, versus say urban Seattle? Um, How do I choose to move within, within communities uh, and interact with them? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I know that's something that's can, can be to my advantage. And other times I know that it is something that other people have taken advantage of. Mm-hmm. And that uh, our people have had that happen to them, uh, whether they were artisans or business people or politicians. Um, a lot of times Filipinos are, are uh, underestimated um, because of their willing t- willingness to compromise. They're seen as weak. Mm-hmm. Um their adaptability means they don't need the same number of resources as insert Asian culture here. Um, you know, as much as there's the, the stereotypical Filipino mom with her slipper in one hand, you know, going after her children, pretty much Filipino moms are seen as the most, you know, loving will die for you women on the planet. Right. Um, so I think Joker also reflects uh, this I, this sort of, well, we don't know what you are. You obviously are confident to know who you are. I just need to figure out how what you have, your skills, your talents, will be to my advantage. Right. And I think that's, um, that's problematic. It's problematic. Mm-hmm. It was problematic when the United States, in my opinion, betrayed the Filipino people and their bid for independence from Spain um, and then created all of these uh, economic and political conditions uh, since then in which there's a certain dependence. Um, Yeah. Yeah. We could talk about that for hours, couldn't we? Ever. I know. I know. Right. Well, yeah, that's, that is the truth. I mean, when I talk to people and, you know, I say I'm, 
you know, I'm half Filipino, you know, and they're like, oh, I know, I know some Filipinos. I cook some good lumpia and they're so nice. You know? <laughs> and do you know, and they fill in that name and you're like, hey, who? <laughs> yeah, sure. Which, which city, you know? <laughs> City you've never been to yet. Yeah, that that's thank you for sharing that. I mean, I can't wait to to you know purchase the book, and of course, um, we I I guess on your website, I'm sure um, you'll you'll let me know um, yeah. where we can you know purchase that book. And yes. so, what are your current projects and future goals now? Right. So right now, I am uh, writing a book tentatively titled. It's a novel. Uh, fantasy, urban, urban fantasy, uh, called Maganda's Comb. And uh, so the image of Maganda's Comb comes from a story where if you ever saw lightning in the sky, it's mm-hmm. because Maganda is combing her hair. And it's the sparks. And, and like I said... Is, I'm sorry, this is a Filipino... Um, this is a Filipino story. This wow. Is, so okay. Maganda's Comb, the, the image, Maganda's okay. Comb. Okay. Uh, if you ever see that... Uh, lightning in the sky, it's because Maganda has taken down her hair and she's combing it out. And that's where you get the sparks for the lightning. Um, So it's as uh, people who write science fiction uh, and fantasy know, it's a MacGuffin. It's the thing that drives the whole story. All right. So like I talked about at the very beginning of this interview, it is that question of, so what happens when you have a Filipina character, uh, Tagalog, uh, who has lived in Coast Salish territory all her life and finds herself swept up in uh, an agreement between um, uh, Maganda, essentially, and uh, Kulshan, or the local um, mountain here. Uh, What happens when that agreement breaks down for reasons that everyone's trying to figure out uh, and conflict is happening. And if things aren't done, then, then bad things happen to everybody. Um, and so that's a work in progress right now. Uh, it's got about 50,000 words under its belt, which is great. Okay. That is great. But it needs like another third or so. Uh-huh. Um, but I'm so excited you have about that. End where you now you're going to have to do the you know resi- the Yeah, I got to stitch everybody together, get everybody at the great. I I know what yeah. the the conflict, <laughs> the last conflict is. Um, I know where all of the bad guys end up. I know where all the good guys end up. I know who's going to die. Um, <laughs> all of that sort of stuff. And so yeah, it is it is a matter of getting those. I words can't wait till that's finished. Yeah, good, that's finished, yeah. good, good, that. good. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Um, yeah. So I have been writing memoir and poetry a lot for the last ten years. So getting back into fiction and, like I said, get what got me into the game. Getting back into that is really exciting. Uh, for me, a little nerve wracking because it's like, oh my gosh, this is very different. But at the same time, I have a really wonderful uh, group of speculative and science fiction writers who are all like, yes, Rebecca, we we love this story um, and are cheering me on. And uh, so, yeah, Good. that's where I am on that. Well, I like to ask my guests uh, this question because it is one way to learn about each other's process. Do, mm-hmm. you, do you have any set routines? Mm. So my ideal set routine is to wake up in the morning and to write at least a page, um, hopefully three pages in my journal. Right. And that's just basically a brain dump. This is the thing that I've been thinking about all night or whatever, and, or this is what happened the day before. And it just kind of primes the pump. Mm-hmm. And then from there, it is uh, a matter of setting a word count during the week. And uh, people who know me will laugh because I talk about word count a lot. Um, So around 2,000 words, give or take. I did NaNoWriMo uh, many, many years ago. And in order to get 50,000 words done in 30 days, you have to write 1,667 words a day. Wow. Uh, And so having that word count just helps me like put a pin in the road 
of, you know, in front of me and say, okay, I just need to get to that place. And I'd say get to that place. And, and more than likely I'll get past that uh, because I want to know about the story too. Yeah. And then the other thing I do is I try to surround myself with people who are also writing. I love writing in, in groups. Um, uh-huh. There's a, a group that I have met with um, on the weekends and we just sit, we don't really talk with each other during the time. Uh, we drink coffee, eat pastries and write. Um, that's always a good thing. And then um, I also coach. I, I coach in a program called The Narrative Project and helping other people write their stories helps me write my stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that for me, it's the whole thing. It's not just generating the material, but it's also interacting with audiences, interacting with other people who are trying to generate material and just, yeah, it's being a writer is that all of that thing. Yeah. So yeah, definitely. I mean, you're very um, methodical and <laughs> you have a plan. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> um, so, but you do help other writers also. Mm-hmm. I understand. Yeah. 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 So like I said, I coach in the narrative project. I also uh, take on a limited number of individual clients. Um, I like to call myself the book doula uh, because everyone's got a book in them. If they're talking to me, typically that's the case. Uh, and so it's like, okay, so how are we going to get it out of your body? You're going to feel so much better once you get it out of your body. Um, and what does getting it out of your body look like? Is it traditional publishing with an ed- agent or is it creating a, a legacy book for your family? Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter, you know, wherever that falls. Um, and so I, I really enjoy supporting people where they are in their process. So I've got various services that I can provide as a, a, a freelance editor and, and writing coach. Um, but like you mentioned before, I do have a website. It has uh, not only um, information about the services that I provide, but also links to my previous publications um, and videos of my performances, things like this. And and uh, if you're a Facebook person, I can be found on the Facebooks. Um, and I, I love chatting people up on, on whatever their projects are. I also go to a li- limited number of conferences um, because it's good to to be, like I said, in that community. So, yeah. And what is your website? It is horribly unpronounceable, just like my name. It's www.rebeccamabanglomayor.com without the hyphen in the middle. Um, So I'm hoping that you'll put that somewhere where your your listeners will will be able to to find it and they can just click on it and try instead of trying to figure out... uh, how to spell that name. <laughs> one last story. People ask me, so what does Rebecca, what does Mabangla Mayor mean? Um, for one thing, this, the, I, it's now my legal name, but it was created in committee at uh, Associated Writing Programs several, almost a couple of decades now, because my name at the time sounded like a British woman sipping tea. And a, a, a bunch of wonderful Jewish writer said, that's not going to do. If you're going to be talking about Filipino, uh, being Filipino and being Filipino American, you need to have a Filipino sounding name. So we put together my mother's maiden name and my maiden name uh-huh. into Mambanglo Mayor. So Mayor, of course, is from major, great, right? Mambanglo means sweet smelling. So I smell really good. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I love so that I'll leave smell. you with that. <laughs> well, Rebecca, it's been great talking to you. And oh, thank you for having me. You and your work. Um, I wish you the very best of luck and definitely will be following you, girl. I'm going to be like, you yeah, know, when's that book coming out? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. That's right. That's another way to inspire me. <laughs> and okay. hopefully you'll get a film option too. That would be cool. Ooh. ooh. <laughs> hey, Neil Gaiman did it. I could do it too. <laughs> All right, it was great talking to you. Thanks, everyone. Well, everyone, that is it for now. Please tune in next week for my next featured guest. In the meantime, have a productive and creative week. Bye, Rebecca. Bye-bye.